Oh, man, I don't have special access like you, man. I don't, I don't have... This meeting is now called to order. This is a public safety committee meeting for January 18th, 2022. My name is Loretta Walsh and I am a council member at large and the chair of this committee. This is a special meeting with the Wilmington Police Department to address a variety of issues not normally addressed at the regular committee meetings and submitted by members of council. At this time, I will call the roll for those members of the committee first. Council Member Gray? Present. Council Member Johnson? Here. Council Member Spadola? Present. Council President Congo? Here. This, me this meeting will cover the following topics. The Wilmington Police Department governance, operations and accountability, the Wilmington Police Department diversity, the Wilmington Police Department use of grants and funding, the Wilmington Police Department community response, and the Wilmington and the monitoring of crime and strategy for violence prevention. The order of the meeting shall be council submitted a list of questions to the police chief. The chief will be up to three minutes to respond to each question followed by a 15 minute question and answer from council members. Council staff will read each question at the start of the topic so members of the public are aware of the pre-submitted questions. Following the council member and WPD exchange, we will allow public comment at the end of the agenda. Each person will have a maximum of three minutes to offer comment. If the public has questions, council staff will collate the questions and we will share with WPD. The responses to those questions will be made public. The purpose of this document is to outline preliminary thoughts for a special public safety meeting hearing. Publishing of the agenda. This is a special public meeting with Wilmington Police Department to address a variety of issues not normally addressed. Council members wishing to offer public comments, individuals wishing to offer public comments must sign up to be recognized and will be limited to three minutes. Public comment will last for a maximum of 45 minutes. Other council members in attendance this afternoon are council member Fields, council member Oliver, council member McCoy. Is anyone else here that I have not seen? Yes, Madam Chair, Council Member Harley. Thank you, Council Member Harley and Council Member Harlan. Yeah. We also have we also have Chief of Staff and Tanya Washington. Staff members. Thank you, so, Councilman Walsh. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Just wanted to, uh, I was having technical difficulties. There is a blowback on what you're saying. Can you hear me now, Councilman Walsh? Am I able to go on with the uh, first topic? Yes, you are. Thank you. Just for the record, my name is Daniel Walker, Chief of Staff for City Council. First topic in the questions are as followed. It will cover Wilmington Police Department governance, operations, and accountability. The pre-submitted topics of discussion to WPD were as follows. Please discuss the training Wilmington Police Department officers receive, 
Please yeah. discuss how those officers are cleared for service following any incident that results in a suspension or a change in duty. Question three, please discuss the psychological evaluation and examinations officers undergo. Question four, please discuss the Dub Wilmington Police Department hierarchy and reporting structure. Please share the number of sworn officers reporting to Inspector Ash and Inspector Emery respectively. Please explain what the white book is for the Wilmington Police Department. And can you share your opinion on the effectiveness of those policies and procedures? Are there any areas you are seeking to change to embrace current best practices? That is the end of the first topic. Thank you. Chief Tracy, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I understand that the rules uh, is going through. I uh, try to keep my answers as succinct as possible and leave time for questions. But with me, should some of the questions need elaboration uh, in certain areas that we're going to go over, uh, Inspector Ash is on with me, uh, Inspector Emery, Captain Bowers, Lieutenant Cyber, Steph Stephanie Hamilton from Victim Services Unit, and John Cook with his team with Chris Ketzler and Jay Washington from Group Violence Intervention. Uh, should we have to get deeper into any of the ones after my presentation? So as far as the WPD governance, operations, and accountability, the first question, please discuss the training the WPD officers have and receive. <clears throat> our officers receive training throughout their careers. It starts with our police academy, a six-month training program that includes training on a range of topics, including cultural diversity, implicit bias, law enforcement, legitimacy, procedural justice, and ethics, de-escalation tactics, community relations and community policing, multi-jurisdictional partnerships and collaborations, patrol and investigative functions, constitutional law, the Bill of Rights, and the state and city laws and regulations, laws of evidence and crime scene processing, critical incident management and crisis intervention, stress management, training on various equipment, including taser devices. They also receive extensive training related to our department on the 21st century evidence-based crime strategies and a multi-layered strategies implemented to address gun violence. Beyond the police academy, each of our officers is required to receive training each year according to the guidelines of the Delaware Council on Police Training, a state-based entity that requires training for all law enforcement officers in Delaware. Officers have built-in training, built training day each month. <clears throat> Number two, please discuss how officers are cleared for service following any incident that results in suspension or any change in duty. Generally, this involves our Office of Professional Standards and Human Resources Division working together to ensure that the officer has met certain criteria as follows. They are cleared to return to duty as necessary by the Office of Professional Standards, City Law Department, City Medical Dispensary, or Delaware Department of Justice. They have completed all the, there's some background information, uh, background. They have completed all missed training and reviewed any new policies or policy updates. They have updated, they, they, and they also have to update range qualifications and they have to complete any required psychological evaluations if required. <clears throat> Number three, please discuss the psychological evaluations and examinations of offices that the officers undergo. Our application and selection process for each Wilmington Police Academy is extensive and includes a number of steps, an intensive background check, physical ability test, written examination, polygraph examination, panel interview, chief's interview, and a psychological evaluation. That psychological evaluation is conducted by an independent doctor who is hired by the city's human resources department to conduct these evaluations. And the doctor has the full authority to remove someone from the selection process and we cannot override his decision. This helps ensure that his evaluation is given serious weight in the selection process for our future police officers. The evaluation uses the Minnesota Multifacet Personality Inventory called MMPI, a psychological test that assesses personality traits and psychopathology. Number four, please discuss the WPD hierarchy and reporting structure. Please share the number of sworn officers reporting to Inspector Ash and Inspector Emery. Well, like any law enforcement agent, we have a rank structure, which includes the chief, followed by our inspectors, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, corporals, and police officers. 
Our inspectors each are responsible for half the department's functions. Inspector Emery is in charge of the administration, which includes communication, support services, and human resources. And Inspector Rash is responsible for uniform services, criminal investigations, and drugs, organized crime, and vice. By virtue of their rank and the responsibilities they've been given, both inspectors oversee each member of the department, regardless of which division a member is assigned to. They would each report up to the inspectors depending on the topic at hand. For example, through his leadership of administrative functions, Inspector Emery is in charge of all training for the department, which involves all offices. This is such a critical function, and we, we saw that over the, and we see that over the last couple of years. In a small department like ours, there's a great deal of collaboration through the ranks. And while it was my responsibility to oversee the department, I rely on my inspectors who are essentially deputy chiefs to ensure our officers are doing what they need to do, that we continue to carry out the mission of the department and that we are prov providing the best service to our residents and visitors. Number five, please explain what the white book is for WPD. And can you share our opinion on the effectiveness of those policies and procedures and all those areas, are there areas that you're seeking to change or embrace current best practice? Well, the white book, that's an antiquated term, but it refers to our policy and procedures manual that all officers receive in the police academy and are expected to follow. Last year, my team worked closely with the city's law department to make their entire set of policies and procedures available to the public on our website with only very limited redactions for public safety reasons. On a regular basis, we review these policies and procedures and make changes to, to update terminology, account for new technology, make sure we're keeping with national best practices. A key part of our accreditation through CALEAR, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, this outside organization reviews our policies and procedures and helps us make sure we're providing the highest level of service to our community. I'm proud to say that we have been accredited since 1994. And we were most recently re-accredited re with an advanced accreditation and we were just one of 32 agencies our size in the United States that achieve advanced law enforcement accreditation and there are 18,000 police agencies in the United States. That's the conclusion of my opening remarks to the, to the uh, original questions on WPD governance operations and accountability, Madam Chair. Council members, now is the time for your questions on what the chief has just testified to. No council members have any questions? Madam Chair, this is Daniel Walker. We have President Congo, Councilwoman Oliver, and Councilwoman Gray with their hand up. Council President Congo. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief, earlier you, you mentioned the responsibilities of your uh, of your inspectors, and you said they both have about half of the uh, the police department under their supervision. Could you be uh, specific and give us? the number of sworn officers that inspectors, that each inspector uh, supervises? Council President, uh, the exact numbers, I don't have on hand, I can get that back for you. But uh, when you talk about administration, uh, which usually has the uh, civ civilian members of the department on that side, they're also included in people that you supervise. And at the administrative side, uh, usually in every department, would have less sworn police officers assigned to them. But as I stated in, in this, that you, the responsibility of having administration and also having uh, communications, having support services, having the police academy, and having human resources affects all police officers. So I can get you the exact numbers of the individuals assigned into each area, but their responsibilities are very important on both sides. Uh, Chief, uh, follow up, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. These, these questions were, were given to you uh, months ago, and for you not to have the answers is uh, is not acceptable. Uh, the, the, the question that I pose is very specific about how many officers is each inspector on supervised, and you're not prepared to give us that answer. I can give you that answer if you can. Chief, you're muted. 
Chief, you're muted. I can come back to that question with it, uh, Council President. Uh, as I have people on the line, uh, we can make sure we can, we can do a research on, on that question and see if we can get that, why we're still on this, on this, uh, <clears throat> on this hearing. Thank you. Council Member Oliver. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that was the same question I was gonna ask. So um, she said someone would come back with that number. That's, that was my same exact question. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Greg. Thank you. I was focused on um, you know, hiring the right people from the very initial um, hiring. And so I was discussing the MMPI test, and that is the standard for determining um, aberrant personalities or deviant personalities. But I had heard, and I don't know if this is true, that if someone is refused based on the MMPI, then they can come back and take it again, and the doctor can determine that they have passed. Is that correct? We have had, we have had candidates that have come back the second time around that have not pass the psychological for, for some reasons uh, that how, how they've been evaluated. And then the next time that they came through, the, the same doctor has passed them. May I continue, Madam Chair? Yes, council member. Well, just a small thing, but I think it would be better if you had a different doctor evaluate it because people don't really change that much, their personalities in a short time period. So for someone to come back and take the MMPI the second time and passed, either something was grossly overlooked or we're just giving them a pass for, for perseverance. I would really like the second time that a different um, professional evaluate them. And I've been licensed to do the MMPI, so I understand the intricacies of the uh, exam. So it's a small, um, small change, but it may work to weed out some of the um, more, um, not violent, but more personalities that don't have control of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, um, does Wilmington PD have any say as to who gets hired to do the psychologicals? Madam Chair, that, that person is hired by City Human Resources. And uh, so some of the things that we do were guided by uh, their rules. Uh, it's something I can certainly take back to city HR and the administration uh, at some of the proposals that uh, that uh, Councilwoman Gray has suggested. And do they just, is their only role in choosing who does the test or do they do follow-ups? It's, it's actually, the, it's a psychiatrist hired by the city, contracted by the city uh, that does the psychological testing. It's, it's one doctor. I don't know if we have a backup uh, doctor at all, but it's certainly uh, something that we can once again bring back to city uh, human resources to, uh, to see if they ha if they have anything that they want to bring another doctor in or or a backup doctor. I, I guess my question really is: Does that doctor? And I actually thought it was a practice, quite frankly. But does that doctor have um, clients within the city other than police officers? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I'm not sure exactly how he's how this doctor is contracted out with any other department. Okay, that would be fair to ask the HR director. So yes, yeah, so I, I would leave that up to uh, <clears throat> I would leave it up to Director of HR to answer that question for City. Department. Thank you, Councilmember Fields. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Um, I have a question. So. Um, you have two inspectors. How many units does both inspector have? Well, the units, uh, you would have, Inspector Emery would have support services, which is really important as far as making sure that we get everything right as far as getting out to the state and, and crime victims. And then you have communications, which is the 911 center, which is really important because that's our first entry of communication with most of the residents. and making sure that we get that right. Uh, we have, uh, and also HR, which is human resources that affects the whole department from attendance to sick, to, uh, to policies and to make sure that everyone, uh, everyone is uh, cleared as assistance to city HR 
and making sure that uh, we have this department running. So it, that's three departments uh, that we have underneath uh, uh, the administration side. Okay, and then the other divisions. one. <laughs> the okay. other divisions are, is Uniform Services Division. And who's uh, that under? That's under Inspector Ash. Okay. Criminal Investigations Division under Inspector Ash and Drugs Organized Crime Advice, which is under Inspector Ash. So it's three divisions on both sides. Okay, you said criminal, um, drug, and what was the first one that you mentioned? Uniform Services, which is patrol. Okay. Now, my next question, can I follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, Council Member. My next question is, um, how often do your inspectors meet with each department concerning um, morale, um, what are their issues, um, how could they do better as a supervisor? Like, is there anything in place that helps the, um, the inspector help their employees or who's ever underneath them to help them grow in whatever positions that they're in? Is there anything in place like that? Yes. Okay. And how often is that done? Is that done yearly? No, I, I, be, I believe that's an everyday trait as any leader in a department. I mean, if you take a human, human uh, I'm sorry, uniform services division, each and every roll call is an interaction as far as developing our offices, as far as intelligence information, uh, coming down to the roll calls, visiting the roll calls, making sure that we have executive management meetings three times a week with our, with our command staff to get the message down. Uh, we have training once a month <clears throat> with all our officers to bring them up on best practices to speak with them. I mean, these interactions are happening almost on a daily basis uh, with our officers to, to encourage them, keep the morale up, uh, make sure that we're following up on things. And this happens on both sides of the house. I mean, you know, the, there was a several, a few complaints about the uh, communications division, but Inspector Emery uh, goes down there once a day and each shift to make sure that everything's going okay down there and to try to make sure that he can get ahead of anything that might be going on. Same thing with support services and on a daily basis, he's over in the human resources division as Inspector Ash is on, on, on her side of the house with the divisions that uh, <clears throat> she's responsible for. Okay, may I follow up, Madam Chair, one more? Yes, Council Member. Thank you. Um, so even though they meet with their, even though they meet with their, um, the people that are underneath them, how often do you meet with your inspectors? Is that on a daily basis or is that on a weekly basis? And if you do, are they, are they allowed, like, are they allowed to bring you, I don't want to say grievances or may, I don't want to say grievances, but what I would like to say is concerns of their employees, like open, a more open communication, um, I don't know. Uh, just, just things like that. Like, I just need. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out where is the communication gap from one expect one inspector to the other, and then, you know, how is how is everybody just maintaining this communication so that everybody's on one accord um, with the police department? I'm not sure. Is, is there an, is communication gap between my inspectors? I'm, no, I'm not saying it's it's, I'm I'm not, No, I'm not saying it's a communication gap. What I'm saying is. If if there was, you know what I mean, or you know, if you just needed to talk to them, or it, or are they able to come into the office and say, you know, hey chief, you know, we had a um, I had a talk with one of my officers. They said da 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 da. How can we work it out? Like I'm just asking, like, how is your communication with your inspectors, and then how does that flow on down? Like it flows up, but how does it flow down? Well, and do the, yeah. With any organization, uh, Councilman Fields, we. We have, we break down the silos and how you break down the silos is by meetings and best practices of meetings. Uh, we start our week, well, first of all, well, I'll get into every day, but let's just start out with our week. In the beginning of the week, we start our intelligence meetings where we meet with uh, all our federal state partners, Department of Corrections, and we do, uh, we do shooting reviews to make sure that we're looking at the individuals that are causing the violence in that community with a collaboration with all our multi-jurisdictional partners. Immediately after that meeting- uh, Are both have, inspectors at that meeting? Inspectors are at that meeting. And after that, three days a week, I have the executive management meeting, which I chair, and I have both inspectors that are on it and all, all seven captains. And then I have platoon commanders and I have sergeants of respective units. And then the 
platoon commander and the patrol sergeants that meet with us to talk about even on a daily basis, how many people are out, how much, what is, what is our, uh, our operational strength, uh, human resources reports out, uh, Captain Bowers, we have OPS reports out, everybody in the department reports out uh, on Monday mornings. And then when we get to Wednesday, we do the same thing to make sure we're not missing anything. And then we go into an executive management meeting just with captains and above after that, after an hour meeting with all the supervisors from most of them, sergeant and above that are working that day. And then we talk about the issues that have hand and how we resolve these issues. Uh, then we do, uh, then we have uh, pre comp stat meeting. We prepare for comp stat on Thursday to make sure that, that we're looking at the trends, patterns, and everything that's going on. And then on, on Fridays, in the, we make it in the afternoon okay. to get ready for the weekend to make sure we're covering all parades, any events, any conflicts that are happening, where we're deploying our people, all their parades, and then and any issues that we might have with personnel. Okay, if I may, we only have three more minutes left. Right. Madam Chair, my hand, is, my hand is up. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So, so Council Fields, yes, there is plenty of communication. Okay. Open door policy and my two inspectors are in the same office as me can walk in any time. So th th they do that each and every day and call me several times a day. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Council Madam, Member Oliver to finish it you. out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question would be to the Chief, how often uh, do you meet with the officers that are not in management? Would I meet with the officers? Not, not no, I said how often, I guess with the guys that's in blue, just your regular officers that are out on the corner when I ask them questions and, uh, you know, how often do you meet with them? Well, I go to roll calls and I speak to them as a group. There's, three, there's 300 officers. Uh, it's, so you meet with them every day, you're saying? Um, I see them in the building. I see them out in the street when I stop okay. up. I see them at so you on, a reg on a regular basis. Yes. I, okay, I, no problem. Okay. That's I, I see them every day. I speak with my officers every single day, but uh, most of a lot of my communication, as in any hierarchy in any paramilitary organization or any business, uh, a lot of the things I have to count on for the, the sergeants are the ones that basically have to get the communication out there with the officers the most. And I do count on chain of command to get messages out, but it's, oh, it's so, I do get yeah, out each and every day and speak with the officers. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Council um, Chair. I mean, Madam Chair. So that means he, he sees them, but I'm, I was asking how often does he meet with them? Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, this part of it is over, uh, but to remember, Chief, that you still have an unanswered question to President Congo. Yes, I'll make sure that if- Now we'll delve into the second portion of the meeting. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Turn it, I turn it back to uh, Daniel Walker, Chief of Staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. The second uh, topic is a discussion on Wilmington Police Department diversity. The following question was submitted and there are uh, subsections to this question. The question is as follows. Um, please provide a chart of the following information. A, a breakdown of Black and Hispanic supervisors in the investigative division, a total of the black and Hispanic officers in the investigative division, how many detectives are in CID, a breakdown of black and Hispanic detectives, how many detectives are in DOCV, a breakdown of the black and Hispanic detectives, and provide a breakdown of the supervisors, including captains, lieutenants, and sergeants in vice and CID by race. Also provide a breakdown of how many females are in the executive staff. And that is the end of that Chief. section of question. Chief, so, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Discussion on WTPD diversity. Question number one, please provide a chart of the following information. <clears throat> You'll be asked to provide an overview chart during the hearing. Uh, these two charts that I put up, uh, I believe answer those questions that, that were asked. So a breakdown of the black and Hispanic supervisors in investigative divisions. There are not presently any black or Hispanic supervisors in these divisions. In the past several years, retirements and promotions resulting in prior supervisors moving to new assignments 
and or retiring captain counts Boothley served in drugs organized crime advice and retired uh, captain Tull served in CID. It's also important to note that the officers have to have three years of experience with the department to be able to apply for these positions and they apply for consider and, and they have to apply for consideration. As we continue to increase the diversity of our department through our ac academy classes, we can potentially see increased minority representation in each of our units, provided that the folks apply for openings. An example, the latest class of new detectives included a black female and an Hispanic female. Uh, B, a total, uh, answer a total of black and Hispanic officers in the investigative division. Between our two investigative divisions, there are seven black uh, detectives and two Hispanic detectives. Question C, how many detectives are in criminal investigations division? Uh, give us a breakdown of black and Hispanic detectives. The criminal investigation division has 39 detectives. Of those, there are nine black detectives, one Hispanic detective, and three detectives with two or more racial and ethnic backgrounds. Question D, how many detectives of drugs organized crime advice? A breakdown of black and Hispanic detectives, asking for a breakdown of black and Hispanic detectives. The drug organized crime advice division has a total of 17 detectives, which of those two are Hispanic detectives and one black detective. Provide a breakdown of the supervisors, including captain, lieutenant, sergeant, and vice by race at the time, uh, CID by race at this time, the supervisors in the two divisions are white. How many females are in the executive staff? The executive staff, uh, that would be one, uh, Inspector Rash. Uh, next question is to discuss the use of grants and funding. Question one, please discuss by title and purpose the grants received by WPD over the last three years in the place of origin. Uh, first one, I'm uh, going to um, Chief Tracy, sure. sorry, that's, uh, that's section two, that's section three you just got on. Sorry, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I did I jump it when I turned the page? Yes, sir. My apologies. So that's the report out of the discussion of WPD diversity. Answering the questions, Madam Chair. Okay, now to council. Council member, Council President Congo. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so Chief, uh, Wilmington is a city of 70% uh, black and brown people. And you said that you have uh, zero black or Hispanic captains, lieutenants and sergeants and all white supervisors. I just wanna make sure I heard that correctly. Correct. Uh, can, and can you, can you give us, um, how, how do you feel about that? Uh. Well, mostly when we start getting up into the ranks where we are, where we are represented uh, with, especially in the executive ranks, when you can make the discretionary promotions, these promotions where we have three black captains, one Hispanic captain and three white captains, and then a black uh, inspector and also uh, a female uh, inspector. Uh, we're, we're represented pretty. We're represented pretty well when it comes to the demographics of the city, but sometimes with the demographics of the department, which we're we're looking to improve and we improve with each class, these are the things that a natural progression will start to start to make sure that we get some of the diversity into these areas. And a lot of these things uh, is people have to apply to be in these units, and we're making headway as far as getting individuals to apply and then also individuals into these units. And secondly, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we did have uh, some movement as far as uh, uh, a black lieutenant and drugs organized, I mean, black lieutenant and drugs organized crime advice was promoted to captain. Uh, and then uh, one that was in CID, a uh, black female captain who retired. So, you know, it's, it's certainly something that we look at, something that we're always trying to be fair and make sure that we're, we're looking for diversity, not only diversity in the ranks and in these units, but also with diversity of thought. To follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, Council President. Thank you. So Chief, you, you mentioned earlier uh, that individuals need to apply for these positions, but do you think the Wilmington Police Department has a culture that supports um, Black and Hispanic officers to apply when there aren't any white supervisors and zero Black there aren't, they're all white supervisors 
and there are zero black or Hispanic uh, captains, lieutenants, and sergeants, and I believe one black detective. It's right here. Do you think, I mean, is there a culture that would even support black and Hispanic officers to even, to even apply when there aren't any? Well, it seems like it would be, I seem like criminal investigations, criminal investigations division has six black detectives, one Hispanic detective and three detectives, two more racial ethnic background. And then even in our last class, uh, two females, one Hispanic and, and one black that did apply are now, are now uh, new, new detectives in the criminal investigation division. And as people start to retire or move on to other positions, this is something that we're looking to do, trying to get to, get to a place where we have more diversity. And sometimes with the amount of supervision some of the supervisors, uh, right now, the percentage of supervisors that we have at the executive level, the problem is we don't have any black lieutenants. We just don't have them in the testing process. There's an A band and a B band, and we, we continually encourage individuals to take the test and make sure that uh, they're, they're taking these tests and making sure that the studying's in and to make sure we get all demographics to try to move up in the department. So there's a lot of people taking the test, but we're also bound by the collective bargaining agreement as far as how many people in an A band and a B band and who we can promote off these lists for Sergeant and Lieutenant and how they score. Just a follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, Council President. Thank you. Um, and I guess to me, Chief, it seems like the, um, the morale would be low for, for officers to even apply for these positions, but they don't, they don't see anyone in those uh, position, but but how are su supervisors selected? Uh, do they apply? How, how, what's that process? Well, we, we certainly recommendations uh, of individuals like all units. Uh, I certainly give uh, as you know, Captain Bowers, if he's looking for an individual to fill in that position, and or uh, Captain Counts or Capt any one of the captains within their divisions. Certainly, uh, there's an opening in a position, but when it comes to these individuals, there, there's some that have experience, that have had experience, especially in investigative areas. And it's something that obviously we're going to continue to work on. And so th these, these are people that interviewed for their expertise to be able to mentor people. And uh, you know, this is where we're trying to get to. This is where we're going to get to. And as the department becomes more diverse, uh, they're gonna start, we're gonna have more people in these units. But, but Chief, how, how are they, Madam Chair? I don't know yes. if you answered the question. How, how are they selected? Ultimately, how are they selected is if there's an interest into any one of these units. And then ultimately, uh, I sit down with both inspectors and we, and we sit down with the commander of the units and we see exactly if there is an opening, who would be, who would be the candidate that they think will best serve. And then we make a decision from there. But who, who makes that decision? Ultimately, it's my decision. It would be mine. Chief, I, I want to take you back on what Council President is asking you, um, if I may, Council President. Yes, Madam Chair. And, and tell me if my um, thought process is wrong. My understanding is if you're in CID, Criminal Investigative Unit, and you don't leave via a retirement, a promotion, or a firing, you're there for life. You're, you're correct. In, in, a, in a department this size, uh, th there isn't a lot of movement. And so there's, there's not, a, uh, there's not a, a, a lot of openings. So, uh, But rather than you explaining to me why right now that is that way, which obviously causes a problem down the road for promotions, right. why are those employees kept in that division? But, well, I, I think what, why we're not seeing a lot of people leaving or going to other departments is because the morale is good. And I think the morale in those units is very good. So they don't want to leave. Well, but does it become a matter of what's also good for the general public and for other police officers to get that experience of working in CID? Um, so then when promotions do come up that they'll not only have patrol under their belt but they'll also have CID experience. Cause my understanding is the same thing is pretty applicable in vice also. Right. That unless somebody dies or gets a promotion or um, 
you know, they get fired, they pretty much stay in place. And I would think that our vice units were pretty well known as most police departments are after a while. So why would you have, and I'm not saying you because it's, it's many chiefs behind you that did the same thing. And is there something written in blood somewhere that this is the way it has to be operated? No, it's not. And, and some, of the, uh, some of the things is having a, a certain time period and a pass through that, uh, that have been done in other places. Certainly something I can take a look at uh, to make sure that we can, we can bring in additional people. But as an opening happens, uh, there, there is turnover. It, it's, it's not as fast. It's not going to get to where everybody would like it to be. But there, there is turnover. There is a thing about uh, uh, experience and knowledge to teach the next one coming up. Uh, that comes into the unit, but uh, in these units, it, they are coveted. There are reward for the work that you do on patrol. They are things that people get noticed and they get rewarded into these units. Uh, and these are some of the things that that's happening. Is there interest in these? Some don't have the some don't have the interest. Some do. Uh, it's and the chairman. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to get into all of that right now. Right. Um, my hand is, I don't know why yes. my hand is not I, I know when your hand was put Oh, up. okay, I'm so go ahead. I can't see it on my side. Right. Uh, Council President, are you finished now for right now? Because we only have like seven minutes left on this topic. Yeah, just, just as a, I guess as a, a recap, uh, Chief mentioned that he believes that morale is high. I just find it hard to believe, especially among the black and brown officers on our department when uh, there aren't any captains, sergeants, or lieutenants, and uh, they're all white supervisors. I'm not sure how he would think that morale could be high, but all right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to recognize two council members who are at the meeting too, and that is council member Darby and council member Field. Um, council member Harley, you're next. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to to uh, just piggyback off of uh, what has already been, sa been said as it relates to the hiring process, um, one, um, when, when minorities especially, um, do not pass the test, one, are they, um, made aware of why they are not passing the test to move up to the higher ranks? I'm talking about the ones that are interested. That's number one. And number two, do you have anything in place to prepare the officers for the higher level uh, management jobs. And when I say that any, anything in terms of um, development, like to help develop them, um, look at the test um, or their opportunities. Okay, we only have five minutes left folks. Okay. And so we were, you know, just trying to get some answers here. Right, sure. Okay. Chief. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I have Inspector Emery on that I give full authority on how we do these tests and how we, uh, how working with the, the outside source company and then finding ways that we can work within it in a test that I inherited and it's part of a collective bargaining agreement. It's also a test that's actually stood the uh, test of being uh, litigated on the fairness of this test. But Inspector Emery, why, why don't you go into the process and, and in some of the things that we do, we work with National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officers to see how we can have study uh, groups to make sure that we can prepare officers uh, for these tests to try to give executive development. And the answer, the quick question, uh, quick answer, uh, Councilman Harley, is that yes, everybody knows where they are on the test, exactly review where they could have done better, and then they are banded so they know exactly exactly how they how they did and where they need to work on for the future. And they're given a test every two years here which is different from every police department. So you have an opportunity to come back and take it again, where in New York and Chicago, you had to wait eight years. So Inspector Emery, you want to uh, elaborate on what I said? Yes, sir. Just to add a couple more things. <clears throat> uh, this time around the process, myself and Captain Bauer sat down and went over what we did in the past and found out basically that there was a part, two parts of the exam process that were antiquated. Uh, we used to have a, out, a book that was not part of our policy that a lot of questions were pulled from. It ended up being way too much information. So we were the only police department out of the three bigs, if you will, that were still doing it. The other thing that we did 
is part of the written exam is open book. There's a lot of stuff that you have to know in this police department, but you can't put everything in memory. So part of the test is gonna require you to be able to know where to find this information. And we also found out that is best practice throughout the nation. And again, we've changed that policy. And the group that we use uh, has been tested, been around for years, and they work well with us to make sure that the questions fall within the parameters of the Woods Police Department. Thank you, Inspector. Thank um, you. I, I'm, I'm going to ha add five more minutes because we do have um, three council members who ha whose hands were up before our time has just rung, has just uh, is gone. So, Council Member Oliver, thank you, Inspector. Thank you so much for your reply. No, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna defer to the other council members. I'm okay. I'll come back on another question. I'm okay. You can let someone else. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have some concrete questions too. Um, how many or what percentage of the police department live in Wilmington, reside actually in the city? And also is the police department currently um, under any federal suits for practices, incidents or anything like that? Councilman Gray, I, I can get you the number of the percentage, but we do know uh, anybody under five years, it's mandated that they live in, within the city limits. So that, that would be the last four academy classes with an average, well, that's easily over, over 100 officers and then some that chose to stay after they had the opportunity. And to my knowledge, there's, there's no federal consent decrees or any investigation uh, coming from federal sources uh, on the police department of the city. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Fields. Chair, um, my, I guess my question was asked about um, the training uh, for, you know, people that would be interested in those different types of positions, but also, um, you know, they might have, um, do they have, do you all have a company um, where you can do like a lunch and learn or different things like that, that can be on a computer that they can do on their downtime to um, enhance what they already know or learn something totally different. Um, the way that way they'll keep their, they'll keep their minds going and they'll keep, um, keep their, you know, just keep their education going. That way, when it's time to apply for another position, they do have some type of background. So I'm just like, I'm, I'm a teacher from, you know, for years. So my whole thing is, it's all about, you know, just getting, getting our people to where they need to be so they can get in those positions. So um, I know you talked about it, but we might, you know, want to look at that a little bit further and how, how deep are we really going to uh, make sure that these individuals are being trained? Then on another hand, for the individuals that may not be interested, how do we get them to be more interested in those positions? Is it because, are they not interested because they don't see anyone that looks like them? Or is it because it's too much too much going on and they just don't want to be bothered. So those are some things that, you know, I would, I mean, you don't have to answer, but I, those are some things that, you know, you can definitely hit, get me back, get back to me about. Um, I just want to know, like, how far do we need to dig? Thank you. Thank you. Council member Oliver. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to go back. To, I wanted to ask a question. Where is um, uh, Cap, uh, Lieutenant Captain Bowers, where is he anyway and whose umbrella is he under? Because he used to run the east side and we used to have a very good communication. Then he just disappeared. So where is he and whose umbrella is he under? Hey, well, Captain Bowers, uh, Councilman Oliver, he act, happens to be on the call with us. He's in, in a very important position where he runs all human resources for the Wilmington Police Department and oversees the academy and the testing process. For, for all our candidates for sergeant and lieutenant. So he is on right now, uh, if you'd like to speak with him. Now, I just was wondering what happened, just like, you know, some of the officers, uh, I'm speaking for some individuals in the neighborhood that we work very closely for with, and then they just disappear and we just don't see them anymore. Um, is Captain Akil on the call? No, Captain, Captain Akil, uh, I'm having Inspector Ash handle all univers uh, uniform service division uh, questions. Captain Akil is not on the call. Captain Counts, who covers the area, uh, well, covers part of your area, your, your council district, 
uh, is now in your area on the east side that Captain Bowers used to have. Again, okay. that on the call as well. Is there a reason? Is to follow up, Madam Chair? Is there a reason why? Fifteen Captain, seconds. Okay, I'm done. Is there a reason why Captain Akil isn't on the call? Uh, I didn't want to take the whole police force out on, okay. on this. I, I thought we had enough representation okay. to cover it. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to remind everybody to please sign up for public comments if you want to make any comments, which will be held at the end of this meeting. And now I turn this over to Chief of Staff. And I'm sorry, I also want to recognize Council Member Cabrera who has joined us. Uh, and now I turn this over to Chief of Staff. Daniel, it's back to you. Thank you, Chairwoman Walsh. Uh, Chief Tracy, the next subject matter, the next topic is to please discuss Wilmington Police Department's use of grants and funding. There are two pre-submitted questions. Question one, please discuss by title and purpose the grants received by the Wilmington Police Department over the past three years and their place of origin, meaning where did this funding source come from? Question two, has Wilmington Police Department ever applied for private dollars to enhance community policing that are free of federal regulation? And those are the two questions for this topic. Thank you, Chief of Staff. Madam Chair, begin. Yes. So to discuss the use of grants and funding. Please discuss by title and purpose the grants received by Wilmington Police Department over the past three years and their place of origin. So I'll just start with the state of Delaware, the fund to combat violent crime. And each one of these grants has been, we have spoken about in uh, public safety committees. Uh, so I'm gonna go over them and uh, leave time for questions. State of Delaware, fund to combat violent crime uh, in 2020, anti-violence overtime, 2021, anti-violence overtime, 2022, anti-violence overtime. This is where we can uh, supplement our budget to put officers in some of the places that we need them the most uh, on top of straight time. Uh, the next one is State of Delaware State Aid to Local Law Enforcement, which is Sally Grants uh, in 2019. This is specifically for training for our officers and could go back to some of the things that uh, mm -hmm. Council, Councilwoman Fields talked about as far as the training to introduce people to other parts of the uh, policing system to pique their interest and get training in other areas they might have a chance to. 2020, same thing with training, and 2021 uh, is both training and uh, equipment for the officers for the latest police academy, uh, which we talked about with was with tasers when we talked about uh, a few months ago at the public safety meeting. Next one is State of Delaware Emergency Illegal Drug Enforcement, ED grants, which each police department gets a, a certain formula within the uh, uh, State of Delaware. Uh, it's overtime in 2019, overtime to support drug investigations, 2020 overtime to support drug investigations and 2021 overtime to support drug investigations. Uh, the next one is State of Delaware Special Law Enforcement Assistance Funds. They call these sleep funds uh, for fiscal year 2020. Uh, we had equipment for the department's hostage negotiations team, uh, upgrades to other equipment and, and needed to purchase newer additional equipment, uh, upgrades to, to the robot for the explosive ordnance disposal team and suspicious package and bomb investigations, and then also a trailer for the use of our traffic division, and then fingerprints, fingerprint scanners to assist in identifying individuals, including victims of crime. In fiscal 2021, we had upgrades to existing vehicle that transports our unmanned aerial systems equipment, which are drones. We had supported, supporting the addition of a new drone equipment to our existing fleet, and upgrades to equipment used by explosive ordnance disposal team, and replacement of aging radar equipment for traffic enforcement and investigations. For fiscal 2022, uh, we upgraded the crash data uh, recorder equipment to allow for traffic investigators to obtain data from vehicles involved in serious collisions. Uh, is equipment for uniforms for the traffic division, equipment for various specialized divisions, replacement of old police bicycles, and upgrade of equipment to assist with mobile forensic investigations. As far as the federal grants, their origin, Fiscal year 2020, uh, we had COVID-19 initiative that every police department received almost in the United States. Uh, we have the higher high intensity drug trafficking area funding for narcotic investigations. Uh, we have victim services specialist position. We have Stop the Violence Against Women Act program. 
We got cold case DNA testing. We got se sexual assault kit initiative for overtime funding for investigations. And as always, we get the burn justice assistance grant for anti-violence overtime funding cold case investigator position. For fiscal year 2021, we had uh, funding for a multi-jurisdictional partnership addressing needs along Lancaster Avenue corridor and at substance abuse and mental health support. Uh, we had motorized trikes in 2021, body-worn camera funding, and also the Burns Justice a Grant for anti-violence overtime funding for a cold case investigator. For fiscal year 2022, right now, we just have the Burn Justice Assistance Grant for anti-violence overtime funding and a cold case investigator position. Question number two, has WPD ever applied for private dollars to enhance community policing that are free of federal regulations? No, our agency has applied for and received grant funding from federal government and state government to support our agency in various innovations. That said, any grant comes with requirements. They may not be federal regulations, but generally grants have specific approved uses uh, will also have reporting requirements. Over the past several years, we have drastically increased the amount of grant funding our department has been able to secure. This helps to support innovative programs and embrace, a, a, embrace approving strategies and new technology without having to increase our department's portion of the city budget and to increase, or to increase the tax burden of our residents. Madam Chair, th those are the answers to the questions in this round. Did you address whether or not we had ever applied for private dollars? Yes, I said the answer was no. Okay, I'm sorry I missed that. Okay, council members, council president Congo. I mean, I don't have my hand raised. No. Uh, Council Member McCoy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so um, this is my uh, question. So I do realize that on several occasions, like Council has actually shown his disapproval of like the grants that the police department uh, have been applying for. As Council and residents, you know, uh, we stress what we would like to see from the police department has not been translated to like, I guess, whoever is writing the grants, which are being applied for. So my question is, even though we've seen SLEAF lots of times, you know, all of the state aid and things of that nature, that multi-jurisdiction thing that you just stated, I think pretty much for one year, like we need to see more of those and we're, we still are not. And are there any type of federal funds coming to, to help those type of uh, partnerships that we need so that the police could just do more of their job rather than dealing with our issues with uh, prostitution and addiction and things of that nature? I, uh, I'm sorry, so that my question is, are we applying for those types of grants? And who is actually looking for these grants? Are these grants being made? Are you being made aware of these grants or is someone within your department actually looking for these grants? Because this looks like the standard stuff that we approve every year. Yes, we're always, look, we're always looking for grants. Uh, you know, it, it's this, looking at the multi-jurisdictional partnership for addressing needs along Lancaster Avenue, a lot of these are done in conjunction with the state and, and we work together with the state. Uh, and a lot of that funding comes through the state and work in collaboration with us. They apply for a lot of these funds. Uh, we also apply for funds for our victim services uh, to make sure that a youth response unit and for positions with that. So we're always looking for how we can do things that we can help victims of crime or make sure that we can help people with trauma and to make sure that uh, we as a policing agency can make those recommendations to these other units. Uh, a lot of this is outside our area when you're asking, when we're asking to do uh, division of substance abuse and mental health, they work mm -hmm. together with us. We work with the, the, the division of health and, and social services. We're working with the Department of Family Support Services. They in, them, in them themselves get some of this grant funding that's specific to them and then they administer and work with us as an agency. So they would be the primary. And, and I, I sit on the Criminal Justice Council as a board member of prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, uh, and other uh, community members for the state. And a lot of these grants that, that you're mentioning, uh, Councilwoman, is, is actually specific to the other, other entities going after them and working together with us. So, we work with more things that are specific where we're competing against other police departments 
And if we don't go, if we don't, if we don't, so a lot of these grants that I talked about, uh, the other state entities, uh, Newcastle Police Department, uh, the state police and other, the other 47 jurisdictions would actually take this money if we did not, if we did not rightfully get our percentage. So a lot of these things are already out there for us to take. And then mo a lot of these things, when it comes to social services and other grants, we're happy to take a look at, but there's also a primary response coming from a state entity and, and working, with, working with other departments. And, and unfortunately, a lot of it's the state who come back and assist us in any way that we need. And they are very responsive. We've been out 10 to 12 times working with the homeless and the mental health. Uh, and, you, as, and as you can see on Lancaster, we're going out with the other three police departments and, and all, the other, all the other entities to help these individuals that need our help. Okay, may I follow up, uh, Madam Chair? Uh, quickly, Council Member, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the things I did notice is the fact that, yes, we do see, the, I notice money's out there and we have to uh, apply, but it seems to me that we, uh, whatever, whoever's looking for these grants are not making, they're not making whatever extra effort to appease council and the residents by finding other monies. These are the same things that we're getting every year. And I understand that we, we would need them for like uh, overtime and things of that nature, but we're not seeing anything, anything come of the funds that are being requested on an annual basis. And I just wanted to know who is our person, who's our contact person, if we find out about grants, who, who are we sending this information to? You, you can actually call over to our office and, and you can, it was uh, Monet Cintron and then David Karras and Inspector Ash, Inspector Emery. We actually look at all these grants and then we bring it down to our grant person. And then we work with either the state or some other entity to help write these grants. Be more than happy to look at anything that you might see. Uh, a, a lot of these, like I said, they're specific to policing and, and certain specific things. But if there's something out there that we think would be worthwhile, we're more than happy to take a look at it. If you see something, and, and, and definitely something we'll look into. Inspector Rash, I know there's, there's a couple more that we're looking at. Can you elaborate on some of the things that, that maybe- Chief, could you follow that up with, with a written? Um, because there are many council members waiting to ask questions and we're Absolutely. already less than 10 minutes now. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Would, would you mind council member getting a written response to that? Oh, that, that's fine. I just thank you for my time, Council Member. Um, uh, Madam thank Chair. you. Council Member Johnson. Yes, yes, Chief Tracy. Um, thank you very much for, um, you know, I, I sincerely appreciate the, the work you have been um, doing in terms of the grants on Lancaster Avenue in, in, in the heart of the West Side. So I appreciate that work. Um, I guess that really goes into the question of specifically regarding to substance abuse grants. Um, has the city um, going after grants to establish a program similar to the county has with Hero Health or something similar to that, dealing with the specific needs of, um, you know, Medicare, possibly reimbursable services? You know, um, are we looking at healthcare field? And again, I know you talked about working in conjunction with the state, but have we applied for grants and not received them or have we not even applied for them yet? Well, we Councilman, we've been working with our partners and we certainly have a, a good relationship uh, to come into the city, to go out continuously to work together on them. Uh, there, there's a grant and we can work with our other entities. Uh, the, one of the things is that how much do you, do you want policing? You know, I'm I, once again on the Criminal Justice Council, uh, I, I'm signing off on grants as part of an overall board of many members on the board that a lot of this money goes into the courts for rehabilitation and case management for individuals that need that help. So there's a lot of other entities out there that have that money, manage those cases. And then, you know, the county has a system that's in place, but that's also through a grant. And they work well with us if there's people, if there's people that have substance abuse issues that they're taken to a detox center on Kirkwood Highway, and then they track it through the system. And we've been working with them as well, as far as what we can do and possibly uh, trying to uh, make sure we do that more frequently and working together and not just on Lancaster Avenue, but throughout the city uh, because of the type of program that they have in place that we can become part of. And I have a follow-up. <clears throat> um, Thank you very quickly, please. Yes, 
Um, just in regards to different other um, federal opportunities, I, I want to stick on federal money. That's a big pot. Um, is the police department looking at augmenting ways so that we can use ARPA funds specifically for the crime deterrence activities throughout the city? Uh, quick answer, yes. Speaking with the administration, probably more to come on that, Councilman. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Harley. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Real quick, um, I don't wanna be repetitive. I think Council Member um, McCoy pretty much wrapped it all up. And my only question to Chief is this, um, would it be okay if city council submitted some topics um, to your department regarding grants? Can we submit them to you? Because I do hear us asking you about different grants that you're looking for, but maybe we should be more proactive in some of the topics that we're interested in and submit them to, to your department. Would that be okay? Absolutely, uh, Councilman Hawley. Uh, and, and if we, we can get a, somewhat an idea. I, I do get an idea where you're coming from, but more specifically, uh, we, we can do that research and get back to everyone. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council. Council Member Oliver. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question would be <clears throat> to the chief. I know we have like over 60 something participants on here. Um, a lot of them, well, a few of them I know are from some organizations who've been asking me the same question. And one of the main questions that is asked in the meetings that I've been participating in is when is the chief going to come out and do a uh, press conference and uh, regarding the crime? Um, and I've said it several times that we know it's not the chief's place. He's not out here making, doing the killings. But I think what it is, what is present, present is that they see on TV other states um, where the chief or captain comes out and just talks about the crime. If it's an all time high um, crime here, if we have an all time crime or, or if we have hit a record number of crime um, with um, homicides or whatever it is, I do. Um, I do respect the public's um, concern about just hearing it from, you know, the face of public safety, because that's, I mean, we as council members are constantly getting beat up about it. Why? Member so, Congo, um, so, um, I, I really do. I really do appreciate your comments. I, I mean, I really and truly do, because I get the same comments as all you. council members do. Thank but you. this is really about grants right now. Okay, no problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hopefully, before it's over, we can hear that. Though, is that possible? Um, if if we had extra time left. No problem. Well, if they can send it to us an email, because that's something that should be real simple. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Chief of Staff, it's back to you. Thank you, Chairwoman Walsh. The next topic to discuss is please discuss Wilmington Police Department's community response broadly, but specifically, can you please discuss in detail the process Wilmington Police Department uses to engage with residents following a tragic accident, any accident, such as a shooting, um, burglary, what have you, outline the timeline for follow-up, the agencies that are involved in this community response, the expectations from you as the chief for responsiveness, and steps for communication after the initial outreach. And that is all for this section. Madam Chair, begin. Yes. All right, discussed WPD community response. Uh, there are a number of key steps that our department takes in, in the wake of possible shooting incident, murder, or some other tragic incident. And first of all, that includes rendering aid to the victim and, to, and making sure that we're addressing their family immediately on that incident. And a lot of them, our officers are on that first responders and actually first on the incident to render that first aid even before the ambulance gets there. Number one, uh, then it's a response by our shift commander, duty captain, our patrol officers immediately that are in the areas uh, who ensure resources deployed appropriately and they have enough resources on the scene to handle it. Uh, development of a post-shooting retaliatory plan, which identifies possible retaliation that might come from an incident and ensures resources that are deployed to prevent this possible retaliation. Investigation by the Real-Time Crime Center and identification of victimology, which can insist in preventing retaliation and determining possible motives. 
making sure who's, who's the associates, making sure who they're in conflict with, and making sure that there's retaliation from the person, people that are friends with the victim against the ones that, if this is group violence in, in intervention. <clears throat> And then we also look for the possible motive, immediate motive. We canvass for witnesses, camera footage that might have captured the incident. We're sharing information with specialized units, investigators can determine if any confidential informants uh, can provide material information, assist in an investigation. Uh, immediately on any major incident, the first call from the scene, from the duty captain, is to the chief of police. And that has not swayed in the, in the five years that I've been here. Uh, I get a call any time of night to make sure we can assess any major incident verbally, and then I'm brought up to date immediately. Uh, sharing, uh, we share the information with the group violence intervention, and if, and if that strategy can assist in preventing retaliation, we discuss with state and federal prosecutors and our local, our local state and law enforcement sharing information. Uh, we discuss during our weekly intelligence meetings, what I talked about earlier with all our partners. Uh, we publicly release preliminary details about our investigation including contact information for the lead detective and contact information for Crime Stoppers, which facilitates confidential tipping and information sharing to help us bring a resolution to this case. The other key component of, of our deployment of our victim service unit would assist with notifications in case of a fatality and the provision of services to victims of crime and their loved ones. Our youth response units also provides assistance to those affected by trauma, including counseling and other services. These responses are immediate and they, they are critical to our investigative assets and to our support in the community. We also make sure that uh, uh, the community meetings that we have, each one of our sector captains that we talked about, uh, Captain Akil in sector one, Captain Counts in sector two, and Captain Campton in sector three. These are our community liaison officers that help coordinate things and get the information out to the community groups and the civic associations on top of the original information that we put out to make sure that we have a plan that's in place that we go over with both inspectors and myself to have a long-term plan in that area. And that's where all our specialized units and then where we can try to make sure if there's individuals that are involved in this violence and who are some of the people that might retaliate or who are responsible, that we make sure we get this on, on it as quickly as possible to prevent any further violence. Thank you, Council Member Gregg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, well, this sort of crosses over the grants and the emergency team. It's known nationwide that mental health response team, crisis intervention teams, they're all called different names, but usually they're made up of mental health workers, drug and alcohol workers, and maybe a social worker. And the stats are nationwide that, um, 25% of all people killed by uh, police nationwide have a mental illness. Also that 20% of the calls for service are for mental health or substance abuse. And the mental health response team has been proven to cut down on violence by uh, 40%. So looking at these statistics and hearing other council members discussing grants, there are several grants that I've come across. Um, one is called, well, one is called COHOOTS, which stands for Community-Based Response Act. And that uses, um, it uses Medicare funds to cover the program. So that's a federal program that uses Medicare funds. And there are quite a few places in the United States that has this program. There's another one called, um, the Treasury Department has um, $25 million available for grants. And then there's another one called Campaign Zero. So all of these are federal grants that are available for uh, mental health and substance abuse response teams or for the police to use. So I've just given you, and I've got several more grants from the feds that are available for the police department or for city council or for the administration to ask for. And we could use that to develop um, a response team that involves some community members and other professionals. So that's my comment and addressing the grants too. Thank you. Council member, did you forward any of these to the mayor or have a discussion with the mayor about this? No, I have not. Okay, could you please follow up with him on what these grants are? Oh, um, rather than council? Okay, yes, there's no problem. Yeah, I don't think council can apply for these grants because- Anyone, it, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I don't think so. Not when a municipality is being given money. 
It usually has to be the head of that municipality. So okay. if you can pull him in on, and um, I'm sure if you have any trouble doing that, you'll get major support on this council to do so. Yes, I was, thank you, Madam Chair, but I was gonna say if other council members are interested in knowing some of this information, um, there are programs across the United States for response teams, and most of them are using some type of federal grant program to fund their uh, response teams. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your information. Council Member Johnson. It's kind of, I know Councilman Oliver asked this last section, so I think it might be more appropriate now, but why is the Wilmington Police Department set up so that a civilian um, is giving public comments? Um, whereas you look at departments like Philadelphia, probably New York, where you're from, um, the TV cameras are there, it's a uniform officer, it's a high ranking uniform spokesman. Why is Wilmington set up that way? Chief. Well, in the last two departments that, that I came from, uh, it was a civilian that was in charge of the director of communication. So it's, it's uh, and even in Philadelphia, they, they have that. Uh, there might be on a scene when a reporter shows up that someone will make a comment to, to an incident that happened. Uh, I, I guarantee you that Baltimore and Philadelphia are not commenting on every shooting. It's almost physically impossible to do that. Uh, and to be out there. And uh, so it's, it's not uncommon to have a civilian uh, person that is actually went to school, has expertise in communications and uh, certainly a degree in it and journalism uh, that they do in other departments to make sure that we put experts ahead. And it's not always uh, law enforcement centric where I'm sending a police officer 40 hours worth of uh, uh, public information school as opposed to someone that has expertise that's in it. So it's, it's not uncommon. And I tried to bring this department into, uh, you know, into the 21st century of policing, where they do talk about having diversity of thought and other thoughts, just not in law enforcement. Okay. And then and, and can I have a quick follow up, Madam Chair? Yes. Council Member. Um, is there a thought towards using a uniformed officer? Because again, I, I'm just going off of concerns. I know my colleagues have voiced um, some kind of frustration. I think um, your, your communication officers, is effective, um, he's very well educated, but I don't necessarily think the community feels or understands what he's talking about. So has there been thoughts maybe having a hybrid or blend or is that a conversation for a different day? Well, I, I do have a public information officer that's, that actually is a sworn sergeant. That position is still in place and, and that person is also talking to the press. So we make sure that we at least are and, and, and getting information out each and every day. Uh, so that is a hybrid that's already in place. Okay, understood. If I may, on the back of your question, Council Member Johnson, I think what is a disgrace in our town is also the lack of information being given out by the news media. That, you know, we have one newspaper now that is only going to be printing, um, what, four days a week? It's supposed to be a daily newspaper for, you know, the biggest city in our state. We really only have one radio station that comments now, and they are kind of hit and miss because they've been cut back too. So the coverage of us has just been horrible. And there hasn't been like any medium coverage of us. It's all been the most desolate coverage there could be that makes us look like the big bad city. So... Mr. Spadola. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, Chief. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, the mayor's office put out a press release uh, talking about how Wilmington police would arrest criminals for uh, gun crimes and other violent felonies, and the court system would put them right back out on the street, and uh, you know they'd be out there committing crime. Um, has that gotten better, or is it still a revolving door? It's uh, you know it's. It's something that uh, I've spoke about many times, Councilman Spadola, uh, at the council meetings the last couple of years. Uh, and, and, you know, it could be COVID. It could be the, the not wanting to put people in jeopardize them during the COVID season. But there are, uh, there's way too many guns. Uh, we have record number of gun arrests last year, and we, we are almost even this year, which is a couple hundred percent from where we were a couple of years ago. Over 60% of our gun offenders are right back on the street. And, uh, you know, and we're not seeing, uh, you know, 
we would love to see original charges and individuals a little bit of a consequence because when they get back on the street, more people have guns, more consequence. And that's what we've seen over the last couple of years. And yes, are we getting better? Are we gonna continue cooperation with our partners in the criminal justice system? I see as we're coming out of this and we know more about COVID and, and how we can adjust in the, in the criminal justice system. Quick answer, yes, uh, we are working together, working with the feds, working for things. And, and I see better things for 2022 and a lot of plans that we have in place and how we've adjusted and, and where we need to be. And we've got a lot of work to do, but it, it's certainly, uh, I, I'm going, I believe we're gonna see improvement because of the collaborations and identifying some of these issues that you just talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fields. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, um, I, have one, I have another question for you. Um, <clears throat> As far as the communication to the community, um, I know you, you um, they sent out the WICs and you get the emails or the text messages and I really um, commend you and the department on that. That's really good. Um, however, I do have to mention what my other colleagues mentioned. When, when I'm in uh, community meetings and civic association meetings, even though our sector captain is there providing us with numbers detailed information um, about, you know, shootings, arrests, guns, so on and so forth. They are really asking to see the face of the Wilmington Police Department. And I know that you can't be at every scene. I know that, um, you know, uh, you know, everything, you, everything is for everybody. So you can't truly explain everything. But I just think that the face of the Wilmington Police Department um, would be beneficial to um, us as council members and you as um, the chief of police, because that's what the community is asking for. And I'm not saying you have to be every day, all the time, whatever, but that's what they're asking us for. So, you know, I'm just piggybacking um, off of what my colleague said. We do get asked that question um, quite often. And, you know, I kind of, you know, I take it back and I'm like, well, you know, you can't say this, you can't say that or whatever. And, you know, he's doing this. So, you know, um, I do do that, but, you know, how do we move from where we're at now to um, another place to where is the community can see that face of the police department? And, and you're absolutely right, uh, Councilwoman. You know, th there's a lot of things that have happened and how we've had a disruption in so many places from education, social services, to non-for-profits, but even the community meetings. Uh, one of the things with the 49 civic associations and getting out to them, you know, that took a break and now it's more technology. I'm hoping now that we can start to get in-person, I'm hoping we can get back to in-person. Uh, those are some of the areas that uh, I have to make sure that I capitalize on as well to get out there physically in front of these groups not just my captains who I need them to be able to speak to speak coherently about the strategy, but you're absolutely right. And you know what, that's something that uh, is one of my 2022 in coordination and, and with coming out of going in-person meetings again, which is something that we've missed for way too long. Thank, Thank you. And I take credit for that. <laughs> Thank you, chief. Council member Oliver. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I wanted to piggyback off of what you said. I agree with you, Madam Chair, um, that we don't have a lot of TV or newspapers that's covering uh, some of the things that's going on in the city. So, I mean, I remember you sending out an email talking about Channel 28 or using WITN or, um, you know, WDA, uh, uh, WDL, just to get the information out to some of the individuals, the participants who are online, who are constantly saying, you know, what they're asking about, you know, a press release or, you know, um, Miss Outlaw in Philly or Chicago, whoever is always out. Um, and, and it's not uh, ununiform individuals that I see on TV. Um, it's always uniform. So if that's all the public is asking for, I just don't think that's a hard ask. But Councilman um, Loretta, I just want to piggyback off of what you said, because you have stated it on several occasions that we don't have a lot of media that is even expressing unless it's some negative news so it would be good if we can use our WI if we could use channel 28 or you know uh, on WITN just to get on there and share some positive information it doesn't always have to be negative thank you thank you council member Harley yes thank I you think. madam chair You're the last one. okay thank you madam chair 
Um, again, because most of my council colleagues pretty much, you know, said the same thing that I was thinking in different ways. Um, it is such a uh, ongoing, ongoing, ongoing conversation all the time in most of our districts about the chief of police coming before the community. We want to see his face, even if it's sharing positive news, but most certainly with the up with the up surge and uptick in the crime, even if it was quarterly, um, just coming before the community to just to be seen, just like the mayor is the face of the city, you're the face of the Wilmington law enforcement. And even though we appreciate all those other modes of communication to share all these statistics, um, the community doesn't read all of that. They don't get all of that. But I do believe if they just seen your face with your inspectors coming before them, I think they really, really would appreciate it, even to just show connectivity and concern, you know, just for the community. So that's all I want to say is to consider doing some um, press conferences court on some routine basis. And it doesn't have to always be to share of negative information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, now I turn it back over to our Chief of Staff, Daniel. Thank you, Chairwoman Walsh. Oh, Daniel, bad. excuse me, Daniel, before I turn it back over to you, I just want to remind the public again to please sign up if you want to speak and that you will have three minutes for any comment that you have to make or that you want to make. So thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Walsh. This is the last session, um, section topic that talks about monitoring crime and strategy for violence prevention. The three questions that were pre-submitted are as follows. Please discuss plans for acquiring more cameras. How effective is the city's real-time crime center? And is it financially possible to keep it state-of-the-art? Uh, talk about in the future. And then the last question is discuss Wilmington Police Department's strategy for combating the continuous violence in Wilmington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, those numbers that uh, uh, Council President Congo had asked for, uh, they were able to send me. I can report out on them if you'd like before I start monitoring crime and strategy for violence prevention. I, I'd rather you answer this first so it doesn't get mixed up in this whole okay. um, question period. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Okay, monitoring crime strategy for violence prevention. <clears throat> Please discuss plans for acquiring more cameras. Uh, the city has a camera working group, which is based out of the mayor's office and led by the chief of staff. Uh, this group also has a, a member of the city council staff that's on it and is charged with meeting on a regular basis to review camera related topics and to discuss the addition of new cameras when funding is available. This group also determines the location of new cameras following the analysis of crime data and the police and that the police department compiles. We're always discussing, a po uh, discussing possible funding streams and options to further expand our public safety camera system. We'll continue to take steps to expand the system and further leverage this technology to help enhance public safety as part of our layered crime strategy. And I know it's something that's important to the administration and uh, there's, there's more to come and discussions on this. Thank you. The chief of staff for Wilmington um, has asked that she had a moment of our time to speak and perhaps she's going to speak on these subjects too. Yes. Uh, uh, Jeff Washington. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Walsh. Um, I just wanted to notify the committee that um, we will be using a portion, portion of the ARPA funds to um, purchase cameras for um, citywide surveillance. So that will be coming down the pike. Um, just recently on Friday, I received a notification about a possible grant opportunity from the Justice Department for funding that may also provide us with some uh, uh, ability to purchase more cameras as well. While you're on camera, um, do you have a relationship with the congressional um, folks where they have staff that actually usually follow grants and things that are coming out of the federal government? Yes, yes. So, that works with us on these things? Yes, yeah, so if, if opportunities such as that comes down the pike, they will, they will let us know. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Gray. 
Yes, but I thought the um, chief was going to speak on um, practices for reducing the crime first. I, I still have number two, part of the monitoring crime right, strategy. So my question is on that. So I'll wait till he makes his comments. Thank you. So uh, question number two of monitoring crime strategy for violence prevention. How effective is the city's real-time crime center? And is it financially possible to keep the, the state of art? <clears throat> Our real-time crime center is a state of the art and is a model for agencies throughout the region and across the country to follow. Uh, there's absolutely a lot of agencies to take a look at our system and how we do it as a technical resource. So it is looked at from other places to replicate. The real-time crime center is the hub of our intelligence-led policing strategy. It includes detectives and crime anal analysts who gather intelligence and share with every member of our agency, as well as our partner agencies. The center is an invaluable resource. They assist with identifying suspects, developing leads for detectives and patrol officers, help share notes with our partners to further investigations, and identify those who are committing crimes across jurisdictions. Our real-time crime center has also been a tremendous resource for the regional enforcement agencies. And we have a strong working relationships with partners throughout Delaware, as well as in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland. And these relationships have contributed to progress and investigations. And if you look at all the carjacking that's happening in the tri-state area, or uh, you can see a lot of the things, a lot of information that we're giving to other states is helping out immensely to try to curb these carjackings that are happening in, in our region. We have been able to leverage grant funding and city budget funding to establish our real-time crime center and have ensured, ensured adequate staffing. We'll continue to ensure this critical resource remains state-of-the-art and that it operates to its fullest potential. Number three, discuss WPD strategy for combatant and continuous violence in Wilmington. We have layered strategies that are part of our approach to combatant violence in Wilmington and making our city safer place to live, work, and play. This includes our core strategies, community policing, with each and every member of the agency serving as a community policing officer and our sector captains as our community liaison officers and coordinators. CompStat methodology, applying business management principles to policing, ensure greater levels of focus and accountability. District integrity, assigning the same officers to the same neighborhood each time they report for duty. Intelligence-led policing, leveraging the department's real-time crime center to help gather and disseminate intelligence to all personnel. Group violence intervention, blending law enforcement, social service provision, and a holistic crime prevention strategy. The integration of NIBIN, which is the National Integration of Ballistic Information Network, firearm and ballistics tracing and analysis, and the launch of an embedded crime intelligence center that were one of only 240 agencies that has this in the United States in partnership with the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives and ATF. We also have an extensive and strong multi-jurisdictional partnership involving in a range of partners, including Newcastle County Police, Delaware State Police, Probation and Parole, Delaware Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office, ATF, DEA, and FBI. These partnerships help pool resources and identify offenders who commit crimes across jurisdictional boundaries. We also work with state and federal prosecutors to identify whether federal or state prosecution can better serve to achieve serious penalties for offenders who are arrested in charge, particularly related to gun violence, fatal and non-fatal. As I have detailed in public statements and narratives released on a couple of occasions last year, our strategies also shift depending on the crime trends we are seeing. We have to be flexible. We know how we and know how to best leverage our personnel and resources to address what we're seeing. These proven strategies, the multi-layered nature of our approach to crime prevention has brought about successes over the years, but there's certainly more work to, done, to be done, especially in this current environment. Uh, we look forward to making progress. We need to adjust, we have adjusted, and it's certainly, uh, I can get into that, but I'd leave it open to questions as far as some of the things that we've accomplished, we've seen success that we got to build off of. Thank you, Council Member Gregg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief Tracy and I have discussed this, but my suggestion is curfew. And I know the community is possibly going to say, why are you bringing more police to interact with the community? But if we want to stop crime, we have to get the guns off the street and we have to interrupt the planning of the crime. And even though most crime no longer is committed in the evening, I'm sure that young people or the offenders that are running around at night are the same ones that are doing the crimes during the day. So I grew up with a curfew. I think it was up until the age of 18, midnight was curfew. And then from 18 to 21, 1 a.m. was curfew. Um, but it allows the police to stop people. And if you have a weapon on you, 
Sorry, you may consider that in the community hassling young black men, but we need to get the guns off the street and interrupt their ability to plan or to react or to be tracking someone. Just my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Johnson. Um, just, just for the record, I, I would have to say um, sometimes me and uh, Council Member Gray on the same page, I would say I, um, I am diametrically so far on the other side in terms of what I, my suggestion for policing, um, just being somewhat enlightened in this field, I don't, and I think you will probably agree, Chief, the police don't actually stop crime. There's very few cases of an actual, you know, crime in action where the police are there. Police are there after the scene and police are there to deter. Um, so at least that's um, what I would probably say most of my colleagues will believe that they're there to deter, not actually interrupt crime, because cops don't stop crime actually from happening. So um, I think what, you know, just getting to the point is, are we really looking at those public safety strategies, those overall, I know you have John Coke on the line from public safety, you know, from the state. Is that really where the future department, is that what we're looking for and towards focusing on those kind of deterrent, focused deterrence programs? Is that where your heart is, Chief Tracy? Councilman, my, my heart's always been with the group violence intervention. Uh, we don't want recidivism. Uh, you know, a lot of things happened to individuals when we talk about education, trauma, breakup of the family, poverty, and these things affect education and then they affect juveniles where they make poor choices. And then finally, the police are dealing with them. And unfortunately, when, when they become justice involved, it's not good. Uh, I, I'd rather not have a kid get into the system the first time because once they get in, I said, then the, the, the uh, rates of recidivism go up exponentially. So if we can find programs and that we can work together, that the ones that are in by the time that they're with us and then we're seeing some of the things where they're expressing at violence at a, at a very young age or expressing where they're actually picking up a gun and shooting on a corner with several people there. Uh, if we bring them in, we arrest them, hopefully we can make sure we can rehabilitate them. And then we can work on a lot of things that cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, you're working with Wolfie, you work with Christiana Care and the programs that they have, working overall with our group violence intervention, with the social services, relocation out of situations that are bad, helping the families. I mean, they, yes, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that because that, that is crime prevention of trying to save people from the situation that they're in and get them the help that they need because that brings crime down and stabilizes the community. Uh, arresting everyone doesn't. And that's not why I'm big on arrests. I'm big on arresting people that are very violent that the community is asking us, please help us with these individuals, but not arresting everyone to get the few that are doing wrong. And then the ones that need help Let's get them the help. I'm, I'm all about that. And group violence intervention actually sits down with these most at-risk kids that might pick up a gun or worry about being shot. How do we get them the help that they need? Because they're in fear. Believe it or not, how much of a brave face they put on. We need to help them. And yes, I, I'm a big proponent. I've done it. I've done it in other cities. And now I've asked to do it here. And it's just starting to get really rolling with a third call in and doing outreach, in reach. And John Cook talked about it several weeks ago that I believe the members of city council that, that were on the call really appreciated what they're doing. I'm not going to go into it that we can put out as a PowerPoint or a follow-up, but the work that they do is invaluable with our other social service partners. And I have one more point of clarity, if I may, Madam Chair. Council member. Uh, and the city already has a curfew on the books. Is that correct? The city already has a curfew generally, right? Chief? Yes. Yes. Okay, I, 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 I just wanted to clear it up. <laughs> I just wanted to get out there that they, we already have a curfew. Okay, gotcha. Right. Council Member Harley. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So to Council Member Johnson's point, um, as it relates to this curfew, so what time is this curfew? Because I was on public safety during the last term and we, were we had actually um, got legislation drafted to do a curfew and we held it. So what time is the curfew, uh, Chief, Tracy? Well, what we talked about at that time, what we what we were gonna do with, with the curfew that's on the books and, and an ordinance that we that we were looking to put in place. I'd have to defer to the exact times. Inspector Ash, are you on the line? Uh, and can you just bring us up to date with the curfew? 
And I think the biggest sticking point with curfews, if the person's out there and, it, and it, where are we bringing them? Where are we bringing them to get the help that they're out there after hours? And, and are, are we, do we have resources first of a facility and or who are the individuals going to help them to find out exactly why uh, they're unchaperoned or there's no guardians out there watching individuals? And it went by age. So Inspector Ash, can you, can you elaborate Chief, on? Chief, actually, if I may, um, and council member, if you wouldn't mind this, council member Harley, can we have this answered in writing? Yes. Because this could open up 25 other sentences to be asked today, and we just simply don't have the time today. Yes, absolutely. I just yeah. was um, wanting to know more about it because I wasn't no. aware that we were working on it. So yes, uh, a, a communication via email will be fine. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You Thank, so you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member McCoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so actually this Rural Crime Center thing is something I had questions about. And so my question is, are we relying so much on this technology of the Rural Crime Center? You know, we've, we've done, um, we spent millions of dollars on putting this thing together. The question was whether or not we have the capability of keeping the state of the art. Is it buildable? Are we able to keep putting stuff to it? Or will once this technology becomes something obsolete, will we have to reinvest another $3 million or whatever to do a whole different one because we've seen some issues with cameras going from one technology to the other and all that kind of stuff. And um, the other thing was more so about um, policing. Uh, the policing we do realize is reactionary, which is something that, um, you know, Councilman Johnson stated. Has there been any real improvement because we have the uh, real crime center? Has we seen any type of improvement when it comes to the policing, the neighborhood, the crime, anything since we made this large investment? Well, I, I'll ask, answer your latter question. And then if I can, I'll have, if I can, Madam Chair, I'll have Inspector Ash answer quickly about okay. the about the sustainability of the real-time crime center. But, you know, leveraging all these things in the real-time crime center, when we were in times where we were doing the type of policing, that's evidence-based strategies using and leveraging technology. It's how you operationalize it. And in 2017 into 2018 and 2019, we had historic lows when it came to violent crime, compared to the last couple of decades. These are some of the things that used in conjunction and leveraging it the right way. Uh, we're not really reactionary. We actually can get ahead of crime. Uh, a lot of these gun arrests that we make, these are, these are not reactionary gun arrests. Uh, these are individuals that have a highest propensity for violence that are involved in the violence. Uh, we might not be able to be able to prove that they did the shooting, but people are giving us information they are the shooters. And until we have witnesses come forward, but they're going to shoot again or be shot at. And so they're carrying illegal firearms. These areas that it's just one example that we can get ahead of these things to try to interrupt the shooting cycle as one of the many things that this, this can do. And in, in light of, as you know, we were last year, it's an anomaly and, and, and we had a high number of homicides and that, that has taken apart lives and devastated families and, and what it has done to Wilmington, you know, th those are things that are incredible, a, a, a negative impact on families and everything. My heart goes out to these families and trying to bring closure and finding ways to prevent this. But if you, in a, in a city where 95% of your murders are by gunshot, you have to make sure you reduce the shootings and you have to make sure that you get the guns off the street and you have to make sure those carrying guns have consequence and do time for carrying those guns and everybody becomes safer and it's happened in other cities. And this year, this year that just ended, we were down almost 16, 17% in shooting incidents compared to last year. And it's the third lowest in eight years, but our murder rate went up because a lot of other things that happened that it's, it would take too much time to, to out of these questions, but these are the things that we do leverage it and overall crime is down. And we look to build on what happened in 2018, roll out of what's happening in a just in COVID era, what's happening in the disruptions in the courts and happening with, with other criminal justice partners and other social services. When a lot of these things break down, we and the police and some of the things that affects what we do out in the street and the public. And I'm hoping to get a lot of this back, continue to adjust leverage this technology. And I think, I think it, it's, it's invaluable as a tool that every police department's using. It has to be used right. And we gotta make sure that we do everything we can 
Councilwoman. As far as sustainability, uh, Inspector Rash, can you please comment on sustainability? You're the expert in the Real Time Crime Center. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Inspector Ash. Um, so just uh, recapping a couple of um, points that you've made, Councilwoman. Um, this was nothing that was invented by the police department. Uh, these were things that were made as federal recommendations first by the first group, which was um, the Violence Reduction Network, where we were one of five cities selected in the country um, to participate um, under President Obama and the Department of Justice um, with Senator Coons pushing um, on the forefront for us to get some level of federal assistance on addressing gun violence. One of the recommendations out of that was um, for us to utilize uh, technologies and uh, intelligence uh, types of approaches, crime analysis um, to better direct all of the resources within the police department. If you also remember in 2015, 16, uh, the Wilmington Public Safety Commission was um, led and start, started by Governor Markell at the okay, time. Inspector, I have to interrupt you on here because the question is, um, I appreciate your history of the crime center, and but that's for another day. The question is, how effective is the city's crime center? So in your um, speaking to us about it, could you give us your opinion then of how effective you think it is as the chief just did in his opinion? Absolutely, Chairwoman. Thank um, you. It is effective. And without it, there'd be a lot, a lot more um, crime, I believe. I was here prior to the chief and um, I believe without uh, this and our investment and continued investment into technology, uh, we will we would be seeing uh, record numbers as most cities are across the country. Okay, thank you, thank you, um, thank you uh, Madam Chair. Uh, but if I can follow, I just wanted to make certain that my statement was whether or not we are relying so much on the technology. I feel like there is a disconnect from us to the community because we have relied on all of this technology that we may end up having to replace at some point because everything becomes obsolete at, at um, seems like at a moment's notice or whatever. So I just wanted to know, that was my question. Um, no, Chair no, I, I can answer question. that if you'd like. I can answer that briefly if you'd like, Chief or Madam uh, Chairperson. Yes. So, um, just real quick, Councilwoman, yes, um, I think the best way, just as most um, businesses operate, you have to continue with the technology and the way that you do that is you don't replace everything all at once because of the increased cost in technology. What you do do is you continue to evaluate and assess that technology and make the changes um, and exploit as much of the federal funds doing that and growing um, these uh these units, um, and then knowing that with federal uh, funds and regulations, you would eventually have to roll it into your operating costs as a, as a city. Thank you. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quick, I wanted to express some of the um, impediments to the uh, curfew, which the last time the city of Wilmington had a curfew, they did a wonderful way of alleviating these problems. But if the police pick up a juvenile um, and they don't have, the juvenile doesn't have any place to go, the police officer can't just dump him in the street or let him go. So they had a holding center. And I think it was a grant with the uh, Wilmington police and the state's health and social services. Yes, and there's a social worker there. So that's um, what has to go with the um, curfew program. And I'm sure when, um, Chief Tracy sends the information out, he'll probably include the, the entire program. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'm going to be turning this over to the Chief of Staff, uh, Daniel. Thank and you. Again, to tell the members of the public that you have to have a question sent in to us. Um, our chief of staff is going to be calling on the people that signed up to make a comment um, and keeping track of your time. So thank you. Thank Ms. you, Chairman Walsh. Um, 
I do see President Congo's hand up. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I did not see something. that. I did not see that, Council President Congo. That's okay. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Chair. Did you want the Chief to respond to my question after public comment or, or before? It's up to you. I did. Thank you for reminding me. Chief. Afterwards or before? Madam Chair, um, go ahead. Now, am I going to ask Council if they want to ask too? Okay. Yes, Chief, would you respond to Council President now, please? Council President and Inspector Emery on the administrative side of the House, 10 sworn officers, 41 civilians, Inspector Ash, 267 sworn officers, and seven civilians. All right, thank you. I'll uh, follow up. Could, could you repeat it? I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. Could you repeat it? I'm sorry. Can I turn it? Inspector Emery, 10 sworn officers and 41 civilians. Inspector Ash, 267 sworn officers and seven civilians. Okay. Thank you. That's a follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, Council President. Uh, Chief, uh, just I guess it seems very off balance. Has that always been the practice or of, of our police department for that kind of uh, imbalance between the two inspectors as far as uh, sworn officers who report to them, 10 versus 267? Uh, no, it, it's actually right with best, best practices, yeah. Council President. Uh, as far as when you look at police departments, the, the importance of the administrative end actually has authority over all the officers because of the training because of the oversight, because of the sick, because of the scheduling. And on that side, what happens when you try to co-mingle and you put operational and you try to balance it, we start to deprioritize important things like communications. We certainly can have easily have issues with communications. It needs that type of oversight from an inspector to stay on top of it, from records and also HR, which is involved in training Training is unbelievably important to make sure our officers are trained properly, to make sure they go out and, and make sure that they are defaulting to that and, and using good training when we're dealing with things and situations out in the public. If you take an example of the Chicago Police Department, the, the chief of administration, compared to a patrol would might have 13,000 police officers and patrol might have 7,000 of them, organized crime might have 2,000, and then you might have 2,000 in, in detectives and, and certain other units. The chief of administration in a department of 13,000 might have 100 sworn officers because they're administering and they're actually managing the whole police department where they don't have to have direct reports up. What they have to do is manage all these other areas that's really important. So it's, it's not uncommon. And certainly the responsibility is not diminished by the amount of police officers that you have. Actually, anytime there's complaint in communications or training or even promotions or how we recruit people, the question it gets asked to respect to every on this because I've gave them a lot of authority to make sure that we can drive those things home with diversity, promotions, and how we do things in training in the police department and communications. So it, it, it is something that is an industry best practice that it's not a one for one that you have direct reports because all the department reports up to them in some in some fashion. And it's and it's not uncommon to have this in other police departments and police departments I worked. Thank you, Chief. Just Thank a couple you, follow ups. A couple of follow ups, please, Madam Chair. Yes. All right. Thank you. I have a couple of follow ups. So before you became chief, was this the practice of our police department with that kind of imbalance or was it more balanced? When when I became chief, uh, I came here to look at best practices. I've been a consultant in a lot of places. And when I looked at the department, I looked at what we were doing here that we weren't prioritizing the administrative end. It was actually falling on the wayside. And I thought training, I thought the academy, I thought the, for diversity, I thought communications. And I looked at it from, from consulting many police departments and being other police departments that this certainly needs to be changed. And I, in my prerogative as running this police department, I think now it's been righted as far as the priorities of the scope of what their responsibilities are, which are both very important. All right, so that was your decision to create this kind of imbalance. 
And what, why, why? I don't was, think it's an imbalance, sir. I, it's, it's actually balanced right with best practices. Why was Chief, why was Inspector Ash chosen over Inspector Emery? Was there a, was there a, a uh, like a test given? Okay, I, I, I think this is for another day, this conversation. I understand your frustration, council member. I don't, I don't think you do, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I do. You, no, you don't. Respectfully, you do not understand my frustration. I don't think that- I didn't talk. And I, I don't think that you, you or the chief understands the frustration of our police department. I don't know this information. I have police officers- Council member, I served with you for 12 years while you sat there while all this was going on. So please don't tell me what I understand or don't understand. Well, if you did, I think you should let me speak and let the public hear the frustrations of our police department. That's the that's the intent of this meeting. Thank you. So, as I was saying, Madam Chair and Chief, uh, you you have a police department that is extremely frustrated with the inner workings and and the politics that goes on. Um, I don't I don't I don't know this information. I have police officers who are coming to me frustrated and demoralized because they want to see some change, and. And they're not seeing it. And you, you said you put this in place to try to increase diversity, but we're not seeing an increase in a, a, a more diverse police department. Um, we shouldn't have to ask you, Chief, to do a press conference. Um, you were given a raise before you even started um, based on your ability to improve our police department. And, and I have not seen that for one as a council member. Um, extremely frustrated just hearing the lack of diversity within our police department. I can't imagine being an officer and have, having to live with this every day. I can't imagine being Inspector Emery. He and I have never even talked about this, but only having 10 sworn officers and someone who is also on your same level, having 267 officers who we, who we, are, who we are, report to you. I can't imagine how demoralizing that might be. Again, he and I have not had this conversation, but there are officers who have come to me with this information that I'm sharing with you and that I'm sharing with the public so that something can be done about it. Um, just for, for, for council to have to ask you to do a, a press conference is ludicrous. Um, it's, I mean, there's a lack of diversity in our police department. There's a lack of fairness and communication with the community and with the, within the police department itself. Um, there's definitely a lack of ac accountability where I was low. And, and honestly, for this chief, speaking on, not, not speaking on behalf of, of council, but as council president, I would have to give you a vote of, of no confidence. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, you're welcome, council president. Um, now, before we turn it over to the public, um, each council member is going to get three minutes to say what Ever they want to say about the meeting? If they so choose, the three minutes. Councilmember Oliver. Uh, it's right now. Thank you. Right now. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, Madam Chair. No, I think it was a great meeting. I think it was very transparent. And um, you know, um, it's you know, I've been talking to you, and you've been waiting for this for months, and I'm just glad to see that you finally was able to make this meeting happen that you've been sending the emails about. So thanks to the chief and all his staff. Great job. Thanks a lot. Council member Fields. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, chief of Police and all the other officers on the call, I wanna say um, I thank you for coming on here and listening to us. Um, we represent the people. And so we have to ask these questions because it is our job as representatives, no matter what district we're in, to make sure that our community's voice is heard. So when we come to you with these questions, we're asking because we wanna know because our community wants to know. And I thank you for an answering these questions or getting back to us um, with some answers. Um, I'm just hoping that all of you um, understand and take what, we, what we've given you and uh, put that to some type of utilization, excuse me. And um, also, you know, give us a follow-up, you know, what, what, what did you get from this meeting and how can we as council um, help you uh, 
you know, do what you need to do. Um, I know it was a lot coming at everybody tonight. And I know it was a lot of things that weren't even said tonight. But again, I just have to say that we are the voice for the community. And we have to ask these questions because they depend on us. So um, I know the frustration kind of got to you and it kind of got to me too, but just know that this is for the betterment of the city of Wilmington. And we do appreciate the work you do. I appreciate my sector captains. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just asking you to take what we said and write it down and just get back to us and give us some answers. Other than this, this was a really good meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you soon. Council Member Harley. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too want to thank you, um, Madam Chair, for making sure that this meeting um, was conducted. I want to thank our chief, our um, inspectors, our lieutenants, and all of our officers um, that are on the call. I appreciate and I really do um, appreciate the work that you're doing as well. But as um, council member um, Fields um, shared, we've been hearing and getting hammered, literally hammered about what is going on with the Council Plain. member, your mic is not on. It wasn't on. Oh, my, my mic is not on? It wasn't on for your last really sentence and a half. Okay, so all I was going to say was this information is all about us getting better and improving. And I hope that this information is being taken seriously and hopefully that there will be some improvements internally and externally as it relates to the dialogue. And, and like council member Phil said, we are here just representing the community. We're not here representing ourselves, even though we live in the city, but more importantly, we want the community to know that we hear them and we definitely wanted to give you the opportunity to respond as well. So thank you very much um, for showing up tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council member Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna thank you, the committee and the police department and my other council members for coming to this meeting and giving their suggestions and making their statements. But very importantly, the public is gonna speak in a few minutes. And I hope that since they're always asking us and they're always asking the police department, what are we gonna do about crime? Give us some suggestions, give us some solutions. You're closer to it than we are. So I thank everyone, but I hope in, pub in public comment, we'll get some feedback from the community as what they think we should be doing. Should be Thank you. Public. Council Member Johnson. Um, I don't want to reiterate everything my colleagues have said, but again, thank you very much, Chief, and uh, the top brass for taking the time to, to, to answer some tough questions. Um, there's a lot of questions that were answered. But there's a lot of questions that are still unanswered. Um, but I think, uh, you know, as long as you continue to work with us on council and realize we're all working on the same team, we're all here for public safety. We're all here to address the crime issues in the city. And let's look at different solutions. And I, um, I take a little different lens. I don't put everything on a police department. Ideally, um, you know, our police department five, 10 years from now will look drastically different. Because um, honestly, I think police departments do too much. We're doing, they're doing mental health. They're doing, um, you know, pe people not going to school, people hanging out on the corners. They're doing substance abuse issues. And I believe that's really outside of your lane. You know, um, I really want Wilmington police to be focused on the violent crime. You go to every section of the city, the other stuff, if there was someone else handling that, they would not be upset, but they want the violent crime stopped. So I think as long as we're on the same page and continue to work on fine solutions, I think we can continue to work for it. So but thank you very much, Chief. And, you know, um, to, to, to be continued, I know we're going to have further dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to uh, the police chief and the brass for being here and answering our questions, as difficult as some might be. Um, I don't want to reiterate what my colleagues have said, but my comment is this, and there is a lot of frustration. Um, I believe and I see the, the reports. 
I see how hard the police is working, the number of guns that you're taking off the street and the efforts of the police department. I hear the frustration that from the police officers directly, as well as we hear frustration from the community. When these things happen, especially the shootings in our city, everybody looks to the police to solve the problem, not really looking at the other issues that contribute to the problems and understanding that a lot of it, the police cannot solve. The police is there when it happens and we'll try to do as much preventive as possible. It's really up to us as the community and the powers that be to try to do as much prevention as possible. A lot of things that need to be done and we're not gonna solve this overnight. And, and we ask people to please be patient. But I also feel that it's better to communicate, to have those open communication with the community, as well as with us, your council members, who are the voice of our city departments, as well as the voice of the community that we represent, and to have that dialogue. I would like to see, Chief, you, the mayor, whomever, even if it's just twice a month, once a week, whether it's Zoom or in person, give us updates. There's a lot of numbers of the work that you are doing that the public doesn't get to see just how hard your police department is working. I also hear the frustration and see how when you do lock somebody up, when you do the work and you make it happen, how they're getting out on bail, how they're being released by the judicial system, and they're back on the street again. It's frustrating because you are doing the job, and I don't think that the, the community understands it. So I really feel that if there was better communication, if there was weekly, monthly ways for just to come out and let people know exactly what you're doing and that you're trying and that the men and women of Wilmington PD are working hard, it would really help us as the members of council who are out there in the community talking to them and also being held accountable for what's happening in our city. Um, and that's just my request. I, I just think that it's just better to go face in and face the public and let them know what's happening. But the lack of communication is what's frustrating a lot of people. And that's why a lot of these attacks are taking place. So that is what I ask and thank everyone who participated here tonight. And Madam Chair, you did an excellent job. Thank you. Council Member Darby. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening. And I want to say thank you guys for coming out to um, answer these tough questions. Um, but what I'm here for really tonight is to listen to the community. There is already um, the community has already voiced what they wanted to want it done in the police department. And it's not even just now for decades because um, police violence and pre police brutality has been a thing um, since the inception. So I think it's um, very clear on what needs to happen. So we keep having conversations about what needs to happen. We know what needs to happen. Um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of things kind of the council people already said about uh, police officers answering calls that um, they're experts in, having a community response team, a civilian review board, those things are really important for our community. But what I really wanna see is a true commitment from the Wilmington Police Department on hiring a consultant to do police reform in your department. And that is looking at every nook and cranny of your department and making sure that it's community centered, that it's going to build community relations, improve it. That is your responsibility. Um, and a consultant will come in and reform the whole department from top to bottom. That is what I wanna see. These other talks and conversations sound good, look good, um, but is the impact happening? No, police brutality has been happening since inception and we're still dealing with it in this community um, nationwide here in our city. So what I'm really interested in is the Wilmington Police Department making a commitment to that. And this year that will be pushed by the community, um, by city council people where we're holding the police department accountable and saying, hey, if you really want to build community relations, you need to have an outside person come in and analyze you guys and do an assessment and give us the recommendation for us on the legislative side to say we need to pass these pieces of legislation to improve our police department and that you also willingly make some changes on your own. Um, so that's what I'm asking for. And I'm just here really for the community comment. I haven't made much comment because to me, the answers and solutions are already there. We've been talking about it since my grandmother was talking about it and my great grandmother was talking about it. So these are conversations that have already been had and I just feel like we're going around and around in circles and we have the answers. Thank you, Council Member. 
Seeing no other hands up, um, I will turn it over to our chief of staff, Daniel Walker. Thank you, Chairwoman Walsh. We have quite a few individuals signed up for public comment um, via our public comment sign up sheet. I do want to remind individuals that you will be instructed to unmute your mic um, at which time uh, you will accept and be able to offer your public comment. I will remind you uh, at 30 seconds that your time is running short. Uh, first up, we have Brandon Fletcher. Hi, good evening, um, City Council, um, Chairwoman Walsh. Um, Wilmington must fundamentally shift policing and public safety to focus on the root causes of crime. Um, it's no secret that the cycles of violence that are endemic in our communities are the result of centuries of racism, disenfranchisement, neglect, disinvestment that have torn families apart and has made it practically impossible to escape poverty. We know it, police officers know it, and yet we continue to look to the same failed tools for a solution that will never come. Um, through efforts like violence interruption, for example, there have been bright spots over the past decades in using alternatives to policing to make our community safer that we have implemented, I guess, here in the city of Wilmington or can model from other states and cities of similar size with similar crime. Um, I just I just think Wilmington Police Department must be a part of this solution, but it is not the solution. And in some cases, it seems like WPD will be a part of a team response, but in other cases, they must not be a part of the response at all. We need a wholesale examination of the areas that drive and give rise to crime, housing, social services, schools, family services, rehabilitation, mental health, substance abuse and addiction treatment that have systematically that have been systematically divested from or just never actually funded and refund those areas. I urge the city government to shift to a problem solving policing model rather than a containment and control policing model that has produced strategies like broken windows policing and unconstitutional uh, policies like stop and frisk that can come from uh, um, curfews, which overwhelmingly target young and black Latino men. Problem solving policing is a model that relies on partnerships within the community and city government to prevent and reduce crime. Reimagining policing means understanding that not all public safety issues require an arrest. There are more tools in the toolbox. Thus, this approach focuses on working with community members to identify the underlying conditions of crime and public safety issues, drawing in and working with other governmental partners to solve them. Uh, lastly, Wilmington residents are the experts and know what the public safety issues are in their communities. Therefore, I urge cities to source solutions from community, community members and invest in the appropriate agencies that can solve them, um, addressing the root causes of neighborhood violence through community outreach and collaborative problem solving is more effective at reducing crime than traditional punitive policing, which targets hotspots and prioritizes surveillance over privacy. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, next we have uh, Ritzy Curry with public comment. Um, I do wanna remind the public that if there are specific questions Staff is collating those questions and will provide the responses from Wilmington PD um, publicly on our website. Uh, Ritzy Curry is the next public comment we have. Uh, we do not see Ritzy uh, Curry on the line. If they are here, can they please raise their hand? I do not see a hand up. Uh, I can make note of that and come back. Next, we have Jay Renee Teague. Jay Renee Teague. I'm here. <clears throat> can y'all hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to address everyone. Um, first, I would like to start with um, the incidents that happened with civilians and police as far as, you know, trust and things like that. Um, the training, the steps and procedures that the chief spoke about 
should be highly effective. However, when things go wrong, often training is brought up. So it makes me wonder, does that mean that training is ineffective? Does that mean it's a failure to learn or apply? Or does that mean the training procedures aren't happening at all? Or, you know, does that mean that more training is needed? Um, there's a lot of questions that are left, but um, what it's sure is that there's definitely a disconnect because things happen and training is often part of the problem. Um, I think that we should definitely consider adapting some of the training modules that were presented to the city council and test meetings or at least consider them or programs like them. Of course, you know, things can still go wrong. And I believe that's where the civilian review boards come into play. Um, I think that they should be civilian led, um, no, no officers past, present or future, but maybe officers with clean records could be subject matter experts if um, a perspective is needed, but they wouldn't be a voting board member. I also believe that funding should go towards um, these, excuse me, again, also the civilian review boards, more directly a consultant that would implement the civilian review boards. I also believe that funds should go towards um, civilian complaint review boards. Okay, I support the city council as far as um, the, having the pro proactiveness of seeking grants and acquiring about them. And I also that think we should do put funding towards um, community response teams, teams that will be specially trained to help and assist people, those that might be having a mental health crisis, might be facing homelessness or have a drug or alcohol abuse program. This would be an entity that is separate from the police. Um, when it comes to violence, I really don't have many suggestions for adult offenders, but I think that when it comes to our children, we need to have more grassroots programs and alternatives to crimes and access to role models through volunteering and program creation, because they definitely become who we show them to be, who we train them to be. Um, again, I appreciate having a chance to address everyone with my concerns and requests. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, we have Keandra McDowell. Yes, good evening, and thank you for, for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I honestly feel as though we do this all the time. We sit there and listen to what the police chief has to, has to say. He answers questions and gives us numbers and everything. And as we all can clearly see that, it's doing absolutely nothing in our community. Um, one thing that we haven't tried is a civilian review board. We need to hire a consultant, an outside consultant to come in and strip and look into everything in the Wilmington Police Department and figure out ways to help our city. Because it's really sickening that we keep doing this and the community keeps telling everyone, telling you guys, exactly what's needed in our community. And it's like, it's going on deaf ears and then another month come back and we're doing the same thing over and over. Um, we need to hire a consultant, professional assault consultant to come in and do what they need to do to get our city right. Because our women's and police department is not doing anything to help us. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have a Shakira Akin. Shakira Akin. Yeah, I'm sick of it. That wasn't even what I was supposed to say, but I'm just sick of it. Okay, uh, thank you. We, 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 we do not um, see uh, Shakira Atkins in the attendees. Um, if they are here, can they please raise, up, raise their hand? The left. I do not see them, Madam Chair. Um, next, we have Donald Farrell. Donald Farrell. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Don Farrell and I am a resident of the east side or the fourth district. Uh, my comments are gonna be uh, in the form of 
questions mostly and I don't expect any answers. They're just observations. Uh, as far as the personnel issue, uh, uh, I've often thought that uh, to increase the number of officers on the street, how many positions in-house are filled by officers and uh, they could possibly be performed by civilians? Uh, also, uh, there's always a major effort to recruit minority officers. Uh, I've often wondered how many black and brown officers aren't on the street versus being on the inside performing support services. Uh, also, I've often wondered, are officers assigned to public housing uh, facilities officially on or off duty? Uh, who pays their salary? Uh, are school resource officers paid by the school district or are they paid by the city? Also, how can we get officers to patrol our neighborhoods like they do downtown? And uh, I'd like to say, uh, as far as the real-time crime center, uh, I'd like to know what metric is used to determine if this tool is having an effect on reducing crime, violence, homicides, and shootings. Uh, how do you define success or improvement. Now, I don't mean any disrespect, Chief, but you came here about five years ago to help reduce crime and all of the shootings that were happening in the city. Uh, I'd like to know, how would you rate your performance? Um, lastly, uh, recently an officer was uh, in his cruiser and uh, he was on Ninth and Pine. And there was a shooting that occurred right around the corner from him, not far away. Now, I don't know what he was doing in his cruiser, but a construction worker had to stop work and inform the officer that a shooting happened and there was a body on seconds. the ground. Uh, so I'd like to know, how do we get officers out of their car and how do we get them to be more present and engaged with the community? Lastly, we recently saw a white shirt walk from one end of Pine Street to the other end of Pine Street. We were impressed. We said, wow, that's what we like to see. The way they walk downtown can we see them walk in our neighborhoods? Time's Who up. pays them? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have on the list, Amy Solomon. Uh, WITN, I do believe Amy Solomon has her hand up under a different name. Okay, stand by. Hello, can you hear me? It's a little dark. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I have just moved out of the city of Wilmington after living there for five years. And um, the reason I moved wasn't related to crime. My neighborhood was very safe. I lived by the Delaware Art Museum. I, I never felt particularly unsafe, but I knew in a very close proximity to me that the, the shootings and the murders and the violence was a daily, weekly, monthly occurrence. And the response from city council is lacking. The response from the mayor's office is lacking. And after hearing the chief um, answer your questions, explain you know, the organizations and the procedure, there's definitely room for improvement, but what I would like to ask of the council is a document on the request made for an Office of Violence Prevention in the city. I'd like to know how the 8 million of promised dollars will be spent 
My question is if the chief can work with the council to implement an Office of Violence Prevention that will be effective and data-driven, a block-by-block -block approach with appropriate maps and coordination with the police and pulling in all the grassroots organizations and community members that we need to. Um, I think that the city definitely needs an Office of Violence Prevention and it needs to be coordinated. So my question to the chief is, does he think that's a good idea? And, um, and what would his top five priorities be for an Office of Violence, Violence Prevention? And where does he think the dollars should go? Um, I'm just interested in his feedback because so far, even though it's been almost a year, since I believe Councilwoman Darby requested that an office be created, we haven't created any documents to, to form Darby. an office of violence prevention for the city of Wilmington. And I think that's a shame and that we should do so with a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose. And um, I look forward to the responses. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Emily Van, I'm going to butcher the last name, but Black, I believe. Emily Van Black. I actually don't have any questions. I was just tuning in. Thank you. Next, we have Carol Banks. Carol Banks. Uh, WITN, do you see Carol Banks? Uh, I do not see Carol Banks on the line. Um, if they are present, can they please uh, raise their hand? I do not see a uh, hand up. Um, Madam Chair, next we have Sophia Sotomayor. Hi, this is Sophia Sotomayor, 4th District. Um, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to give a special thanks to Captain Count for taking time out of his busy day to attend our monthly meetings when he can. It does make a difference um, and I appreciate it. So that was all, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Tony Baum. Tony Baum. It looks like Tony Vaughn is muted. Again, Tony Vaughn, looks like you are muted. Watching football. Madam Chair, uh, I do not see a response from Tony Vaughn. I did want to circle back to Ritzy Curry. Uh, we still do not see Ritzy Curry on the line. Um, if they are here, can they please raise their hand? Madam Chair, I do not see Ritzy Curry. Uh, I do believe that concludes public comment. There are no other signups. Thank you, uh, Chief of Staff Walker. Um, to council members and to members of the public, as was stated during and prior to this meeting, that all questions will be answered and will be posted on the website. Um, and at this point, all I need is motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not part of that. Need a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who took their time to participate in this. 
And also, thank you very much to our staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Loretta. You're welcome.